Bibles, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, and we're only looking at one verse tonight. Um, I don't know if many of you guys have seen it, but at the beginning of this year, a survey came out, and I think it might have been commissioned by the Presbyterian Church as a whole. Um, not sure exactly where it came from, but it's on the condition and kind of the state of faith and belief within the country of New Zealand at the moment. So like really, really current, really, really clear, really, really good picture of where New Zealanders are religiously at the moment. And I found it incredibly interesting, uh, but not interesting enough to read all 67 pages of it. Uh, I found it just interesting enough to read the wee little infographic that they have uh, that shows all the pretty pictures of all the data that they collected. So we're going to start off there. Uh, we're going to look at kind of the picture of where we are and then um, kind of look at some scripture uh, after that. So just in case you're interested, um, if you went out and asked random New Zealanders what they actually believe religiously, um, according to this study, 35% of Kiwis would come back and say uh, that they have no religion at all and no beliefs. Don't care. 20% would say uh, that they're spiritual but not religious, so they kind of believe something's out there and they believe that uh, there's some sort of being, but they wouldn't call themselves religious. Uh, and then going past that, 12% of Kiwis would say that they actually subscribe to religions that are not Christianity, uh, which for those of you guys who've been following along with the math, uh, leaves 33% of Kiwis asking on the street, are you a Christian? Uh, yeah, yeah, I am. But if you look into it even more, uh, that breakdown of the 33% of the Christ people that actually call themselves Christians, um, I don't know how you land on it, but 14% of the overall population would actually say they're Catholic as well. So there's kind of a breakdown even among the people that would say that they're Christians, uh, where only 19% of the overall population would say that they're Christian in the sense that they're either Protestant, Evangelical, Pentecostal, kind of fit into that uh, category. Then, kind of a bleak picture, one in three Kiwis would even say that they're Christians. Uh, if you break it down even farther than that and start looking at church attendance, uh, there's, of those people that say that they're Christians, 40% of them uh, are in church once a week, every week. So 40% of everybody that says they're Christians, in church. But by the same token, nearly the exact same percentage of people, 39% of people who say that they are Christians, go to church less than annually or not at all which means, statistically, you are equally as likely to find a Christian who goes to church every week as you are who does not go to church at all. Scary. Uh, going and looking at um, kind of their religious journeys, 26% uh, of people say that they've never been religious. 24% of people say that they continued in the faith that they were brought up in. Uh, and then 23% said that that faith that they started in, uh, they've decided to give it up because it's just not what they believe anymore. So by the same token, you're equally likely to find someone who has continued in the faith that they're brought up in as you are someone who has given it up because they don't believe it anymore. And to me, here's where it gets uh, even scarier. So 14% of people would say that they've just taken a whole bunch of random beliefs and kind of synthesized them into some religion that they have created of their own whatever. Uh, and then 7% would say that they've come from one religion to another religion. So uh, switching religions, really, really small number of Kiwis are actually changing religions. And then the smallest percent out there, only 5% of Kiwis were not religious at all and then chose a religion. And that's not even Christianity. So in case you can't see it and kind of feel it, as of the beginning of this year, the picture of Christianity and religion within this country right now is pretty bleak. Like it's dying. 
no one at all is hardly switching religions or even becoming religious at all. And I look at these numbers uh, and I look at kind of the state of things uh, and I'm like, God, what are you doing about this? Like, do you see this stuff happening? Are you aware of this happening within this country? And I know you guys have been looking at Daniel, so I know that you know uh, that God is in control of absolutely everything. Like, he raises up kings, he raises up nations, he brings them down at his will, he's completely sovereign over it all, so it is no surprise to him, but it can still be heartbreaking for us and is probably is heartbreaking for him as well. And so I leave it where I'm like, man, God, what are you doing about this? And part of the solution is what we're going to look at tonight, because I feel like part of the solution uh, would be you and would be us. And my reasoning for that uh, comes from 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 20. And it says this, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God, making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. In order to kind of start to unpack this, uh, it would help to understand a little bit more about what ambassadors are and kind of what their job description is. And I found one little paragraph online as I was researching it that just nailed it. So I pulled out like four different things and we're just going to look at it. Um, so an ambassador uh, is someone that carries the approval of the king or whoever sends them. In my mind, it's easier to understand if you use the language of king, but they still have ambassadors today. Um, so they get sent by presidents and prime ministers in almost every country across the world that has ambassadors. But it works better, in my mind and spiritually, if you assume that they're being sent by king. There's the spoiler. Um, so they, they carry the approval of the king. Uh, it's not just a title that he hands out randomly. No one can claim it for themselves. They actually have to be designated as an ambassador. Their job is to deliver messages from the king. Uh, their job is not to negotiate on what the message is, and it's not to enforce the message if they choose not to follow it. All their job is is to be like, look, this is what the king's saying. What are you going to do with it? Following on, their job is to represent the king and only do what the king would do if he were present. Uh, so they kind of carry the weight of representing their nation and the people that sent him. And even more importantly, the king himself um, is reflected upon based on how the ambassadors actually act. They're also supposed to seek only to do his will and not necessarily their own. Uh, kind of ties in with the negotiating thing, but they're not there um, to do what they think is best, and they're not good. To, they're not there to change the king's terms. Uh, they're there to carry out exactly what he's asking them to do, um, whether they feel like something different should be done or not. Uh, and lastly. Uh, they're sent to a specific location for a specific reason. So, uh, cards on the table, that's us as Christians, right? We, uh, because of what Jesus has done, we carry the approval of our King absolutely everywhere we go. Our job is to deliver the messages that God has given us for the people that he sends us to. We're supposed to represent him in everything that we do uh, and do only what he would do if he were present. We're supposed to seek only his will uh, and not necessarily our own. And we are sent to a specific location for a specific reason. And so to bring it home a little bit, uh, when's the last time that you've actually considered that there is a reason that you are where you are. There's a reason that you're living where you're living. And there's a reason that you're working where you're working. And you're in the clubs that you're in. And you have the social activities that you have. And part of that reason, and arguably the main reason, is because you're an ambassador. And where you are and what you do 
God is actually making his appeal to those people around you through you. How does that sit? <laughs> because here's what uh, we kind of have to realize. If this is true, and if we are sent by God, and he's actually making his appeal through us, there's some things that we really, really need to know. Uh, and the first one is we have to be really, really clear on what the message is that we're actually supposed to be relaying. We cannot afford to mix that up because it reflects on the king. We have to be people who actually know what he says and what it means when he says it. We've got to be people who know our Bibles. But it goes a little bit deeper than that because it's not just about theological knowledge. Um, you've got to know the message, but I think it's, you've got to know like the character of the king as well. If you're going to represent him, you actually have to understand how he would respond in certain situations and why he would respond that way and not other ways. And so, yes, it's knowing the message, but it's also knowing God for yourself. It's not something that other people can do for you because they haven't been sent where you are. It's not their job to deliver the message and kind of represent him how you're called to represent him. And so you need to know him for yourself. Know his character. Know his heart. Know what he likes. Know what he doesn't like. Know how he would respond in your situation. And then the follow-on from that would be we must know how to live in a way uh, that actually reinforces the message of the king and does not hinder it. Because it would be wildly inappropriate uh, for an ambassador to get off of the boat or the plane or whatever if he was sent with messages kind of pertaining to national security um, to instead of going and actually dealing with it, he decides to go to the pub, he decides to just take his time, he decides to have a few drinks, uh, he decides to kind of get a little bit out of control and start being a bit rude and maybe racist and a bit wild. Uh, and everybody knows that he's not from there. Everybody knows that he's an ambassador. And so they start looking and they're like, who is this guy and what is he doing? And they'll be like, he's the American ambassador. That was a joke. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, it would be wildly inappropriate. Oh, sorry. It would be wildly inappropriate uh, because he's not actually representing the king well. So the way we live has to actually represent our king. And I feel like there's a weight there that we need to really, really appreciate because the message actually can be hindered. And the way God appeals, he appeals through all of us, all of our strengths and all of our weaknesses, which I think we don't really like to talk about very much. I think the tendency for us as Christians, especially when we get around non-Christians, is to kind of put our best foot forward, where it's like, here's all my strengths and here's all my shiny bits and here's all the bits that'll really make God look good. Uh, but if we're honest, a lot of it is stuff that kind of makes us look really good. <laughs> but the reality is, is that God's big enough where he actually appeals through all of our strengths and all of our weaknesses. So everyone is watching how you use your strengths and everyone is watching what you do with your weaknesses and your failures. Because it says volumes about your God. If you work really hard and you're able to use some of your strengths in a really amazing way, if you take that credit for yourself, that says volumes about what you believe about your king. And in the same way, uh, if you stumble and you fall and that's okay, uh, but you try to cover it up and pretend like it didn't happen uh, and aren't quick to claim the grace that is yours, that also says volumes about what you believe about your king. So the way that he appeals through us uh, is through all of us, all of our good bits, all of our bad bits, uh, and there's grace to go around. If you're sitting there 
uh, kind of wondering, how could God possibly appeal through me? The kind of situation that came to mind when I was thinking about this for me was, um, there's this place in the States back home, and I've only been to it a couple times, but it's this kind of cave network that they lead tours through. So you hop in this elevator, uh, you go way down in this cave, they open it up, you've got this tour guide and you just start walking down. And I'm not sure how many of you guys have done these tours, uh, but they kind of point out different things where it's like, look, there's a stalactites and there's a stalagmites. And they walk along and they point at random things and they're like, look, doesn't that look like an elephant? And you're kind of squinting and you're like, kinda, I guess maybe it does. And they lead you on down. Uh, and then when they get to the final end of the tour, uh, there's this moment where the whole thing has kind of been lit up really well. Uh, but you kind of turn a corner and it's just pitch black. And all you hear is this really, really loud roar. Uh, and then they turn off the lights behind you for effect. And it is dark. <laughs> you are way down in the earth. And you know that there are people like only a few inches away from you but it doesn't matter like they could be 300 miles away from you for the amount that you can actually see in that moment and then the whole climax of the tour is they flick on the lights and there's this massive waterfall there uh, way underground that you can just see all of a sudden and it's really cool um, but the reason that I tell you that story uh, is because when we were in that darkness and when you could not see your hand in front of your face, um, I can promise you that if someone had pulled out their keychain and had flicked on one of those little pin lights on the keychain, just those little like half a watt lights, everybody within about half a second would have seen that thing turned on and would have been paying attention to the light because it's so blooming dark down there. And the cool thing is, uh, I think God does the same thing with us, where I don't particularly think that he's worried about how many watts you have in your flashlight. I think what he wants you to do is go into the really dark places and turn it on and not apologize about turning it on and let him worry about the rest. People see light in dark places. It's just our job is not to make our lens really dirty. Our job is to try and let it shine as best as we can, whatever light we have, and not apologize for it and let God do the work past that. Because I think uh, sometimes, if you think about it, uh, it can be a little bit crushing uh, when you think about the fact that God is calling us to be ambassadors wherever you go and he's calling you uh, and telling you that he's appealing through you wherever you go but if that's discouraging uh, it's because we've forgotten that Jesus has already done it so just by way of encouragement, uh, Jesus was the ambassador that we could never be. He was uh, he did carry the approval of the Father from the second that he got baptized. The heavens were open. This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. His job was to deliver messages from the King. John 8, 28, I do nothing of my own authority but speak just as the Father taught me. Uh, he perfectly represented the King and did only what the King would do if present. John 14, 10, I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. The Father who dwells in me does the works. Um, he sought only to do his Father's will and not necessarily his own. John 6:38. I've come down from heaven to do the will of him who sent me. Uh, and then, of course, he was sent to a specific location for a specific time uh, by God. The amazing thing is, uh, is that it's not our job to convert people. God does it. It's our job to go and be a light and shine it's okay if we stumble, it's okay if we fail, it's okay if we don't get it perfectly because Jesus already did. And we have to rest in that. And if we sit under that freedom, then you can go into the darkest of the dark workplaces and friend groups and social circles, and you can shine and you can trust that God is using you. 
because he is. And I think sometimes we think that when uh, we are ambassadors and we're sent by God, that it will be really easy. Um, we sometimes think that because God is for us and because we are sent by him, that it will be easy. Uh, but that is just not true. Like ambassadors get sent into really, really difficult places. Uh, they get sent into economic trouble and civil unrest and political turmoil. And their job is to do whatever they can to bring peace. And it's the same thing with us. We will get sent into dark places and it will be hard. But that doesn't mean that you're on the wrong track. And that doesn't mean that God isn't using you. And it's even hard kind of spiritually. So going back to this survey, they asked non-Christians about their openness to talking about religion. Uh, and unsurprisingly, the results are pretty bleak there too. 10% of Kiwis that aren't Christians said that they'd be very interested in talking about religious things, which is sort of encouraging. 15% uh, said that they would consider it. Uh, so if you're street evangelizing, you've got a 25% chance that they'll actually want to hear what you're saying. But the flip side of that math is that there's a 75% chance that they don't want to hear a bar of what you have to say. They don't care. But they need to hear it anyway. The message is far too important to stop just because they don't want to hear it. And by way of analogy, again, if you had an ambassador go to another country and they're kind of welcome in like, hey, this is the ambassador, great, come on in. And they welcome him and they take him in uh, and they set out a big meal for him, uh, all the local kind of like delicacies, fruits and vegetables and uh, berries and everything on the table. And as the ambassador starts to look at what's set out for him, uh, he realizes that some of the berries they're actually serving and everyone else is eating, uh, they actually have back home. Uh, but back home, they've realized that those berries are actually crazy poisonous. And as you eat them, uh, they just give you wicked stomach aches. And if you eat enough over time, the poison will actually build up in your system and it will kill you. It is actually really unloving of that ambassador to not try and do what he can to show this other country that what they are doing is killing them. It's not loving for him to try and respect their culture and not necessarily tread on their toes and be a nice guy and walk away being like, well, I hope one day they figure it out. Because they won't. They don't see that what they're doing is actually killing them. And somebody's got to tell them. They have to be told. But I understand uh, that it is hard. So I'm a member uh, of the fire brigade in Gore, uh, and I love those guys. And the reason that I decided to join is because there's like very, very, very few Christians in that crew. And none of them are very interested in any sort of religious thing at all. Uh, and so I think, especially as someone who's kind of involved in ministry, it's really, really healthy to be around non-Christian people. Uh, and what it's made me do is actually wrestle with, okay, what does this look like? How do you actually engage these guys that want nothing to do with religion whatsoever? And I have not quite figured it out. Uh, but here's what I do know. I know uh, that when I go down there, every single time, what I'm praying and what I'm clinging to is like, look, God, you say that I'm an ambassador. You say that the way that I speak and the things that I laugh at and the things that I talk about around those guys particularly makes a difference. And so I pray that you'll use me. Uh, and I promise you there is no one in Gore praying for those guys more than I am. Because I want God to do something. 
And I pray that when the time comes, uh, I will actually be able to implore them because you do care. You want to see them changed and you want to see God move. And so what does it actually look like for you? Do you care about those non-Christian people that God's actually placed in your life? Because I love that idea where it's like, God, uh, Paul, we implore you, we want, this is like a heartbreak thing. Like, man, we want this for you. Please, we want you to know God. And so maybe it's the kind of thing where you think about those non-Christians that you're interacting with and there is actually like literally habits of yours that need to change because they just don't represent God. Or maybe uh, it's as simple as just praying for them because he does use it. But the cool thing is um, that Jesus has already done it. Man, we can rest in him and what he has done and trust that he loves those people far more than we ever will. Let's pray.